to get some new eyes to be able to see him in all of his regalia, the light that emanates from him, the Lamb of God. God our Father who will light up eternity light up our lives thank you Lord for lifting that up before the Lord well beloved you have your Bibles would you join me in Romans chapter 12 and we're going to read from Philippians chapter 1. Romans chapter 12, we'll, we will launch from there and review. But we're going to read from Philippians chapter 1, beginning at verse 20. We are slowly making our track toward chapters 2. We have some business there. And also in chapter 4, as we continue our series Renewing the Mind Philippians chapter 1 and verse 20 According to my earnest expectation and my hope that in nothing I shall be ashamed but that with all boldness, as always, so now also Christ shall be magnified in my body, whether it be by life or by death. For me to live is Christ and to die is gain. For if I live in the flesh, this is the fruit of my labor. Yet what I shall choose, I know not. For I am in a strait betwixt having a desire to depart and to be with Christ, which is far better. Nevertheless, to abide in the flesh is more needful for you. And having this confidence, I know that I shall abide and continue with you all for your furtherance and joy of faith. That your rejoicing may be more abundant in Jesus Christ for me by my coming to you again. Only let your conversation be as it becometh the gospel of Christ. That whether I come and see you or else be absent, I may hear your affairs, that ye stand fast in one spirit, with one mind striving together for the faith of the gospel. You may be seated. Our message today is stand fast in one spirit with one mind. It's actually in verse 27. Stand fast in one spirit with one mind. Our focus on our way there and concluding will be striving or laboring together for the faith of the gospel. Laboring or striving together for the faith of the gospel. Our Father in heaven, giver of every good and perfect gift. We give way now to the ministry of your spirit. God, I come.
come before you as I usually do, and the frailty of my person, and can't do anything apart from you except sin. And when I do choose to do that, I have to take from you, use the spirit you've given me on the body that you provided for me to live in. I have nothing to do anything with. I pray that you would bless your people today. That your church would be built up. That the gospel would go forth. That the saints would be comforted, encouraged in the Lord. In Christ Jesus' name, amen. As I've said on a number of occasions, and I'm going to be saying it until, I'm convinced that salvation and sanctification affords us the once in a lifetime to become a a child of God that we might be like the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, we were created by the word. That's, that's the son of God. The designation of the one who was with God. We were created for the word. And beloved, we were created to do the word. We are supposed to be word creatures. We operate in a realm of words. When you consider Adam, that God did not have to teach him words, nor what to do. I just truly believe that if we follow the instructions provided from the word of God into our spirit, that we would be able to be as Adam was who he didn't ask God questions. He had knowledge. He had words and actions that pleased the Lord. And he was a mere man. He was a son of God. According to the writer of Luke. Seth, who was the son of Adam and Adam, who was the son, he was of Theos. He was of God. But we are the children of God. We are sons of God. And if we follow the instructions with our hearing for listening and our mouth for speaking, our hands for serving, our feet for walking, we can be on that level of doing exactly what God wants us to do. He created us in true righteousness and true holiness. We have the Son of God, life infused into our existence. And therefore, we should be like Christ. The Spirit of God provides to each member in the body of Christ a requirement given in the Holy Scriptures for us to present our bodies unto God. Because if you remember that before we can even get around to the mind, we have to deal with the sacrifice that we are to Give of our bodies. You, you can just do this at your leisure everywhere where Christ went, not to the degree of his suffering, 
Those of us, we identify with Christ, his death, burial, his resurrection. We were raised. How do I know we were raised? Because we are presently seated in the heavenly places. God said that. So from the scriptures, the spirit gives us the requirements for us to present our bodies. He tells us what type of sacrifice. The sacrifice must be a, a living sacrifice. The condition of the sacrifice. The sacrifice must be a holy sacrifice. We have to have that satisfied. And then we go on, as it is in Romans chapter 1 and 2, be not conformed to this world. Or, or don't, it really means stop being fashioned like the world. It, it carries the idea, not in the, in the text of how we dress outwardly, but there is an indication as to whether or not we have stopped fashioning ourselves according to the world by how we dress, how we appear. But, but that's not the text. But that's an indicator. We're not to be fashioned or put into the, the mold of the world and shaping and that the behavior that the world continues to commit which is something that we can relate to because that's how we were living before we were saved by Jesus Christ. So we are to essentially put off the old man. We saw that in a previous lesson. And now, be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed. And we saw where Christ the, the word of God who was tucked inside of flesh. He came forth, he broke forth, and he was clothed in light that was, you could almost feel it to the degree that Peter became so afraid until he didn't know what he was saying. He said, Master, it is good for us to be here. In other words, who Christ was came out and it draped him. And there appeared Moses and Elijah. For us, that metamorphosis that occurs should be the new man coming forth out of us that when we go, Christ ought to be identified as our Savior. He ought to be recognized and maybe folk won't be able to put their finger on it, but that's something different. It's like you don't belong here. It's like you're from another realm. Simply because of how you dress. The new man that's on the inside has come over shattering even the tabernacle we live in. And then in verse 2, that he may prove, this is where we get to prove whether or not we have presented our bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is our reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove. Now, this is where we get to prove that we've done this by the enabling power of the Holy Ghost. You may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. And then in verse 3, Paul says, For I say, and this is beautiful here, y'all. He said, For I say, through the grace given unto me. What could Paul say apart from the grace that wasn't given to him to the church? He had nothing to say. Paul had no word for the church. 
no revelation to give, no impartation from the Spirit apart from the grace that accompanied the truth. The grace given unto me to every man. You know, just when things had been satisfied in verse 1 and the sacrifice offered and received and the putting a stop on the old life as far as being molded and shaped into the world. But then being transformed, Paul said, but wait a minute here in when we get to the renewing of the mind, for I say unto you through the grace given unto me to every man that is among you, and every man includes everyone in, in chapter 12, explicitly, explicitly verse 1 and 2, but also in the book and to the church. He said, but this I say to every man that is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think. That's, that's what I just heard a few moments ago in the exchange between a dear sister and a, and a servant here in that exchange. Not to be high-minded. Paul dealt with this, and I want to just give you two illustrations as we move. He dealt with this in chapter 11. And in the backdrop was where Paul was making an argument that maybe hadn't even happened. He was looking at the natural branches being cut off from the olive tree and the wild branches, the, and they being grafted in. The natural branches would be Israel, unbelieving Israel. And the wild branches would be Gentiles who have believed repentance through faith into the Lord Jesus Christ. And back in chapter 11 and verse 17, I'm going to pick it up here in verse 17. And if some of the branches be broken off, and thou, being a wild olive tree, were grafted in among them, that is, grafted in among believing Israel, and with them partaketh of the root and <coughs> fatness of the olive tree, boast not against the branches. The, 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 you have nothing to say against unbelieving Israel. Keep your mouth off of them. That's what he's saying. You don't boast against them because you're in and they're out. But if thou boast, thou boastest, bearest not the root. But if thou boast, listen, you don't, you don't bear the root, but the root bear you. Is essentially what he's saying. Thou will say then, and this is the argument that he's saying, he's already down the road further. The branches were broken off that I might be grafted in. Verse 20. Well, because of unbelief were they broken off, and thou standest by faith. The only reason they were broke off is because of unbelief. The only reason you in is because of faith. And it, listen, the faith didn't even originate in you for faith coming by hearing, hearing by the word of God. Be not arrogant. That's the word. Be not high-minded. Be not haughty. And he, and he tells these, in this argument, he tells these Gentile believers that this is how you're going to have to deal with being haughty and arrogant and, you know, proud. You're going to have to fear, and then this is what it says, for if God spared not the natural branches, take heed lest he also spare not thee. Talking about high-mindedness. He's warning them about high-mindedness. 
In another place, in verse Timothy chapter 6, same verse 17, First Timothy chapter 6, verse 17, charge or command them that are rich in this world, that they be not high-minded, arrogant, haughty, nor trust in uncertain riches. So these are perhaps, it sounds like to me, it appears that these were perhaps those who were rich in the world and they were saved. And they come into the kingdom of God. And now they're going to have to get with the kingdom program as opposed to that of the world system. And wealth and riches. Nor trust in uncertain riches, but in the living God who giveth us richly all things to enjoy. That they do good. Do you see the chain? Everything that he gave them, he's given to us that we might enjoy. For, for, for what purpose, Lord? Do you have a purpose in that, that they do good? That they do good. That they be rich in good works, not misers and cheap and chinchy. Ready to distribute, willing to communicate. Laying up in store for themselves a good foundation against the time to come that they may lay hold on eternal life. These folks are saved. They're on the way to glory. And they want to see Jesus Christ in his appearing. Our hope is eternal life. Our hope is seeing Christ. Because that's the prayer he prayed. He said, Father, that they might see me. Oh, he sounded so, oh, here's the Lamb of God without a shadow of a doubt. It, it was like, it was almost like, and I don't want to say this all the reverence I can muster, but he sounded almost as if he was a child. Because he, I just want them to see me in the glory that I had with you before the world was. I want them to see me. That's eternal life. That's eternal life that we might see him in all of his glory. In Romans chapter 12 and verse 3, I have to think more highly than he ought to think, but, but soberly. It is to, to be right-minded. To, to be sound in mind. And he said, for some of us, this is going to take some work. Because even since we've been saved, we've been goofing off and conditioned in our mind for, for things that are mundane. You see, if, if you just knew that you were working with God as Adam was working with him in the garden, that wouldn't be the time for drifting off, not seeing the, the big picture. Well, to the degree that the Lord would ask Adam, what will you name this? Or that? Or it? But soberly, according as God have dealt to every man the measure of faith. Some of us may have there's the gifts of the Spirit. There's the, the gifts of God. There's the gifts that Christ gives to the church. And, and if you have a gift, you probably have more than one. And all of the gifts were given that the whole body would profit with all. Not for the one who received the gift to profit alone. According to the devil. To every man, the, the measure also of faith. That's been dealt. All right, let's go over now to Philippians chapter 1 and verse 20. 
Paul has in view. That, that's a lot of moving parts. Paul, Paul's life is busy. He's working in the ministry. He's suffering for Christ. He's being persecuted. He's being ostracized. He's being misunderstood. But at the same time, he wants to live in such a way that pleases God no matter what it costs him. In verse 20, it says, according to my earnest expectation and my hope that in nothing I shall be ashamed. But that with all boldness, and underscore this, as always, so now also Christ shall be magnified in my body. Who's going to do the magnify? Christ will magnify himself in the body of the apostle, Paul. It's not about Paul. Paul wants us to know Christ will magnify himself. And Paul is thoroughly convinced that it doesn't matter even if it's life or it is death. And see, in the process of our minds being renewed, this old life, y'all, as big and awesome as it was when we were a child and we couldn't wait to get to the age of 18 and, and then they started moving the, and then hey, now you gotta be 21 and then the next thing you gotta be 25 big as this world was this old world starts to get small in gradations it starts to become manageable not that we can manage it but it doesn't have the same appeal to us that are in Christ Jesus you to the point now, you don't care if you go or you stay. As a matter of fact, you're not all that concerned if they go or they stay. You just want to be where Christ is. And where you are, that's where he is. That's some things. My wife, she's, she's got to be back in the room saying, you mean to tell me he ain't going to do that? You mean to tell me he don't want to do this? He don't want to do that. What in the world is happening to him? I'll tell you what's happening to him. The word of God is happening to him. Oh, I got a long ways to go. I'm still in the woods. I'm still in the wilderness in some areas. Y'all pray for me. Don't leave me out there by myself. Don't leave me hanging, children. Pray for me. But there are some things don't move me no more. And I don't care if I ever participate in it again. Glory to God. Paul oh, said, so if I can't say this, whether it be by life or by death. And Paul knew that his situation was, he was going to be facing death in the not too distant future. Paul said, for to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. Never in the flesh, Paul, Paul was, was doing, I'm crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live yet not I, but Christ liveth in me for the life I live now in the flesh. I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me, gave himself for me. Paul said, It don't matter, you know, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. I'm down here living with him and for him. But it's a different situation. The Spirit of God has, as believers are saved, and, uh, and, uh, and I'm getting ahead of myself, but there's a house of God where God the Father and God the Son and the Spirit of God is their holy habitation. That's what it said over in Ephesians chapter 2, I believe. And, and, and the Spirit is a habitation. And Christ is down here. He's in his church. And he's working. He's up there. He's in glory. Can't explain it. Oh, I know it is what the scripture says that it is. But after I live in the flesh, that is, this is the fruit of my labor. Yet what I shall choose, Paul, I don't even, I, I, I want not, I know not. For I am in a straight betwixt. I hope you understand that. This is how I understand it. Paul is saying, I'm essentially between a rock and a hard place. I'm between the rock of ages 
and the church that Christ is building, which is a rock body. See, the church is made up of members. Peter called us by the Spirit. We are living stones. Christ is building a stone house. Paul said, here's the situation, church. I find myself caught between the rock of ages and the church. I find myself caught between the one who is the stone in which the builders rejected, who has become the head of the corner. I'm stuck between that and the body of Jesus Christ that's still here on the earth. I'm hemmed in, y'all. I'm pressed in on every side. But it's a good thing. Because I have Christ on one side. I have his interest on the other side. His blood paid for the sins of the world. But specifically, efficaciously, for those in the church. Paul said, having a desire to depart, to be with Christ, which is far better. Won't let nobody fool you. Well, I just want to stay down here and see how things don't go. Listen, we don't want to hasten leaving here, but Paul is letting us know to be with him is a whole lot better Amen. than being out here. Paul ought to know this because of the revelation that has been given to him by the grace of God. Grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. Nevertheless, to abide in the flesh is more needful for you. And Paul, that's good because you're going to be there for them, meaning you're going to have something to say to us. And having this confidence, I know that I shall abide and continue with you all with the furtherance and joy of faith. I love this. Paul said, I'm, you know, I'm going to be around for a while, but it's for your furtherance. The word furtherance is for your progress. Paul wasn't and didn't want to stay if the church wasn't going to move forward. Now, that's not into endeavors that match the world. It's not into building buildings and buying property. It's just into people in the church, children of God, knowing that, listen, this is where I used to be, but now this is where I am. And I tell you what, I like where I am now. I thank God for teaching me. Paul said, I'm going to be around that the church would be furthered with the gospel. Paul is, Paul is doing just like those boys when they was over there, Paul was headed to Rome, and that ship was loaded down with all that cargo, and then the fella started just throwing the tackle off. But well, Paul is throwing the tackle off. He's giving us everything we need that we might be able to live a holy and a righteous life according to the scriptures in the spirit of God. He can take it from there because he's the one who authored the scriptures. It's for the furtherance and get this, it is for, to continue with you all, for your furtherance, and, and, and there is a, there is a, like a goal here, in addition to, I should say, in addition to, and joy of, and it should be the faith. <laughs> in other words, you're not progressing if you're not, and don't have joy, in the faith. And you may not have joy in what's going on around you. You may not have joy in things that have happened to you. You may not have joy about things that folk have threatened about you in the future. But you ought to have joy to the degree that you can have the joy of the faith. That, that when you, when, when they say Jesus, you just light up like an old light bulb. You forget where you are. And joy of the faith. That your rejoicing may be. And look at this. Everything here is, is increasing. That your rejoicing, that's the faith that's over there in verse 25. In, in, the, in, the, in the last three words, joy of the faith. Joy of the joy of the faith. That your rejoicing may be more abundant in who? Specifically in the church. Now, who's in view is Christ. This is the joy of the Lord. The joy of the Lord is our strength. But in this case, our rejoicing may be more abundant in Jesus Christ for me by my coming 
to you again. And I love this part right here. We're almost done. Listen to what he says. Only let your conversation be as it becometh the gospel of Christ. In other words, what he's saying is the church is to live becoming of the gospel before God. The church ought to behave in the church as we live before God becoming the gospel. Our life should mirror the gospel of Jesus Christ. No one should be confused whether you're a church child. And I say that and I want to make a distinction. I'm not talking about the church of Jesus Christ. I'm just talking about someone who knows where the place is, where to find the seat, when to stand, when to sit, when to give, when to go, when to forget about it. I'm, not ta I'm talking about someone who is in Christ. That as the scripture says that we are to let our conversation, that's our life, the manner of life as we live before God. It ought to be becoming, it ought to be worthy of the gospel. Our behavior in the church, and that's where we live and move, we have our being. Where are we going to go when we're not in the church? We save you always in the body of Christ. In the church, when we do come together and when we depart, when we do come together, my behavior ought to be becoming of the gospel. You ought not consider me to be a joke. You ought not consider me to be playful. You ought, not to, you ought to consider me to, to be serious about God and the things of God. I want to look out in the bay and somebody working on my vehicle and they out there acting like it's, you know, Saturday night at the Apollo or, it's, you know, it's the com com comedy club. You know, they out there laughing. I don't know what's going on and happening out there. The church is not that place. So we have to live in such a way that it communicates the fact that it's worthy of the gospel. But that's another place. We have to also conduct our lives in the world becoming a gospel. How we talk to people, our, our facial expressions, what we say and what we don't say. What we say under our breath, and that's something that God can hear, but the more important things we say out when we get angry. And when things are not necessarily going the way that we want them to go. Paul said that whether I come to see you or else be absent, but this is so beautiful. Paul said, listen, I may hear of your affairs. Paul is just saying this. If I come, <clears throat> when I get there, the Spirit of God going to reveal to me what's happening. I'm going to be able to observe believers their conversations, if they're being taught, if they're being fed or fleeced, if they're being led or misled, if they're being played for cheap, just to keep, you know, the doors open on, on a movement that keeps a little bit of money coming in to keep things going. Paul would be able to know when he gets there what the affairs are, but I love this part right here where he says, that I may, or else be absent, I may hear of your affairs. The church there in Philippi, even if Paul didn't go there, he should hear what's happening at that church. I'm wondering. Y'all already know. Y'all already looked at my briefcase. Y'all know where I'm going. What if the Apostle Paul, and Paul is not the, not, not, the, not, the, not the Lord, but what if we were assembled back in Paul's day and Paul came and he visited us by God? What would he find the affairs of this local church? What would he have to say to us? 
And you know he gonna put it right down the middle. Paul gonna sling a fastball and ain't nobody gonna be able to hit it. Well, what about this? What about if the Paul, Paul, the Apostle Paul couldn't come to Sandston, Virginia because he got tied up and tangled up in pressing matters as he's making his way to his final destination as to how he glorified Jesus Christ. Shouldn't he hear about this church? No church is on an island. A church on an island is no church. We need community. We need fellowship. We need those praying for us and those of like faith. The church is not like something you do and you just move it off to the side. I don't mind. We just want to do our thing. Paul would call us out. He would send us someone to say, my God, what are you all doing over there? No one has heard from you. Have you gone AWOL? Where are the souls? Are you, are you evangelizing your family? Are you sharing the gospel? I would want to know. Because the church is on the move. The church is the body of Christ. And Christ was on the move. And he's still moving. He's working. Lord, I know you're working. I know you're moving. I sense that you're working in our midst. But I'm concerned with the Apostle Paul would say, but let me just push him aside. What about you, my Lord? What about what you see? What about what you hear? What about what you hear in our bedchambers? What about what you know? How does it, does it grieve your heart? Or are you excited about the potential of this church doing great things by your spirit from this word here alone? I'm concerned. In the job you're on and you ain't concerned about how things are going, something wrong somewhere. And this is service to the Lord. It's ministry to his church. And we ought to be replacing ourselves. Pastor Trey was talking about that this morning. The Lord said replenish the earth. Our culture and society said we're not going to do it. But we're going to enjoy the process. That was not God's will. The same is true in the church. God wants his resemblance in the earth. But he's looking at Christ in the face of the risen Savior, the Lord of heaven and earth. Paul said that I may hear of your affairs. And this is what he, listen to this, that ye stand fast in one spirit. All of our lessons have had something to do with one. There's one body. There's one spirit. There's one Lord. There's one faith. There's one baptism. There's one God and Father over all and above all and through all and in you all. One. Also, this is what I'm looking for. Because that's what the spirit is looking as an apostle. He's looking for this. And here it is. The renewing of the mind is so that there would be one mind. And this word for mind is where we get our word for soul, suke. It can mean mind, but it's, 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 it's less to less degree. But it's made to be one soul. Think about it. One spirit, or maybe one attitude, one disposition. One soul. What about this? One, we have one Lord. We have one head. There's only one body. Why wouldn't that be one spirit? Why wouldn't that he expect us to be on the same page? We're on the same sheet of music. We're moving forward. And whoever's being left behind, he said, come 
home. We're going to come back and get him. And we can't leave her. We got to go over there where she's at. She's still with us. She hasn't left. And for those who are not, as Pastor was saying earlier, is that some of us, we don't catch it like, like everybody else catch it. I'm, I'm, I'm experiencing that myself now. It's amazing what a few birthdays will do. You start overthinking things. And then we can't get the simple, the mundane, the things that you ought to just know. But what really have those who are not getting the lesson? And they come to Bible study. What about those who come here every Lord's Day and just not quite able to get it? we got to investigate that so that no one is left behind and no one falls through the crack because the crack is Hades and that crack enlarges itself and then one day it'll be the lake of fire. Now, I just truly believe worst place to go to hell from would be a church that teaches Jesus Christ through the resurrection from the dead when he was raised with all power with one mind. And finally, striving together in other words, believers who are striving, laboring, working. Pastor, what can we do? Where do we need to go? What's the assignment? What is the Lord saying to you in your prayer time? What are you being led to do? What do we need to do? Where do you need me at? How do you need us to pray? That's the kind of thing Paul is saying, laboring together for the faith. That is the faith of the gospel. Where our families recognize that we're saved. Our neighbors know that there's something different about us other than we get dressed up on Sunday. And they don't hear nothing. They don't know nothing no more than that. That we labor and we strive for the faith of the gospel. We'll pick this up some way in Philippians. Our Father in heaven, we sure do thank you. <clears throat> we thank you for Paul and all of the other writers of Scripture and the author, your spirit. We thank you for your church. And we also thank you for your darling son, the Lord Jesus Christ, who has with open arms and an old rugged cross welcomed all of us in through anguish of spirit, great deep disappointment, because this was his creation, Father, that went awry. And he did the only thing that within your predetermined counsel within the solitariness of you, thy spirit in him that could be done to salvage all, but it would require him having to taste death for all of us. We want to just thank you. The Father, we'd be remiss if we didn't just thank you also for your love, your mercy, your long suffering, your generosity, your loving kindness, all of what you've done to save us. And hey, you're making it available for those. And Father, for those that are under the sound of my voice, they may not know you. They're on their way. Separate from eternal life, but on their way to eternal damnation. Lord, I pray that this message, by your spirit, that they would hear and see themselves. And that they would repent of their sins. And that they would trust the Lord Jesus Christ and be born again into the kingdom of God. Pray also for the church that this message will help us to make sure that we are renewing our minds by the scriptures and that we're living in such a way that our minds are not haughty and that our hearts are not becoming hard and indifferent as we live in these evil and wicked days. So we thank you and we give you praise in Christ Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, beloved.